Let's talk a bit now about SARS-CoV-2 vaccine development. Now, all viruses actually have a very similar structure and shape, which is that they have a viral particle. Inside of the viral particle is RNA or DNA, which is the genome of the virus. And on the surface are proteins that are responsible for the viral particle to be able to infect a host cell. Now, in the case of SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus that's responsible for COVID-19, we know this is an RNA virus. And we also know that on the surface, there are these proteins called spike proteins. These spike proteins are a hallmark of this particular virus. And in fact, when we were first able to visualize this virus on an electron micrograph, we saw these densely packed spike proteins. And that's actually how the coronavirus got its name because it made it look like a crown. Now, when we think about vaccine development, there's a couple of different techniques that can be used. And I'm gonna cover some of the traditional methods as well as some of the novel methods that are being used for the first time with SARS-CoV-2 vaccine development. Now, traditionally, you would use the whole viral particle to try to induce immunity. And so you'd be looking at using either the live virus, an attenuated version of the virus, or an inactivated version. This is a very tried and true method, and is in fact the way that the common flu vaccine is usually made every year. But for the purposes of SARS-CoV-2 vaccine development, it has a couple of disadvantages. One is that the development timeframes are usually a little bit longer. It takes a, a little bit longer for development in, in manufacturing. And two, in order to uh, pursue this method, you actually have to culture and grow a lot of SARS-CoV-2 virus in large batches. Now, SARS-CoV-2 is a very virulent virus. And so in order to actually culture and grow this virus, you have to make sure you have a lab that has very, very strict safety precautions. And so a lot of vaccine developers find this to be not very attractive and so aren't actually using these particular methods this time around. Although, of course, there are a couple of vaccine developers that are pursuing this. Instead, most vaccine developers are actually looking to try something different, which is instead of using the whole viral particle to induce immunity, they're just going to try to use the spike protein of the SARS-CoV-2 virus to do that. In the phase three clinical trials that we've seen so far, there's a couple of different methods that have been used and I'm gonna cover those. So one that we've heard about is the adenovirus strategy and another is called an mRNA vaccine. Now with the adenovirus strategy, what we're looking at here is something actually very interesting, which is to use a different virus, in this case, the adenovirus. The adenovirus is a virus that's very, very common and in fact is responsible for many of the common colds that we see every year. Now, the strategy that's being employed here is to take the adenovirus and actually hijack it and take out the DNA that's normally within that adenovirus and replace it with the DNA of the spike protein from SARS-CoV-2. What you're doing then is you're using the adenovirus as a vector to introduce the SARS-CoV-2 DNA into your patient. And then once it's in the patient, the SARS-CoV-2 DNA can be transcribed and translated. And now the patient's immune system can react to just the spike protein, hopefully inducing immunity to SARS-CoV-2. What's really interesting about this particular strategy then is you're actually taking advantage of the natural behavior of the adenovirus in order to use it as a vector. Now, there are a couple of things that have to be taken into account here. One is that most vaccine developers are choosing to use a replication inactivated version of the adenovirus. This means that when the adenovirus is introduced, it can't actually replicate within the host. This is really important when we're thinking about engineering this viral vaccine because we don't want to accidentally infect the host with an adenovirus. The other thing that's being done here is that because, as I mentioned, the adenovirus is such a common virus, it's actually possible that the human host is already immune to the vector that we're trying to use. So to try to prevent that, vaccine developers are actually using adenoviruses from other species. In this case, they're actually looking at using a chimpanzee adenovirus as the vector. And that way, when it's introduced into the patient, that patient doesn't already have immunity against that vector. The other type of technique that we've heard about is the mRNA vaccine. So mRNA vaccines are very, very new, and the underlying principle is super simple. What they're trying to do is actually just take the mRNA of the spike protein, modify it to make it a little more stable, and put that whole thing inside of lipid nano nanoparticle and introduce that into a patient to induce immunity. Now, the idea here is just that the mRNA of the spike protein will be introduced into the patient and that the patient's natural translational machinery will recognize the mRNA, translate that into spike protein, and again, now the host's immune system can respond to just the spike protein. It's a very, very simple idea. Now, in both of these cases, for the adenovirus as well as for the mRNA vaccine, these are actually relatively novel techniques. In the case of the adenovirus strategy, this type of technique has only been approved once before for an Ebola vaccine that was approved earlier this year. 
with the mRNA vaccine, this is actually the first time ever that we are evaluating mRNA vaccines as a potential strategy for vaccination. So this is actually the first time that the FDA is looking at this type of data. These strategies have a couple of advantages. One is the development timelines for these vaccines is much faster. And a lot of these vaccines can actually be synthesized in a lab rather than grown in a culture, which is a huge advantage. Now, of course, we don't really know then because of how new these techniques are, what the long-term side effects might be. So there's definitely some unknown in terms of mRNA vaccines and adenoviruses, once they've been introduced into large, large populations for a long period of time, what the long-term side effects might be in those populations. So that's something that we're gonna have to take, uh, keep a very close eye on as we look at these vaccines that are being developed for phase three clinical trials.